from the heart of your community. This is Calon FM. Yes, indeed, this is the Stage and Screen Show with me, Andy Snowden, here each and every Saturday, 12 until 3 p.m. on 105 Calon FM. And coming straight ahead from level 42, all the way over there in Oslo, Mike Lindup. He's next. It's the Andy Snowden Radio Show Show. It's the Andy Snowden Radio Show Show. It's the Andy Snowden Radio Show Show. It's the Andy Snowden Radio Show Show Show. Now then, Mike Lindop is a musician best known as the keyboard player for the British jazz funk pop band Level 42, which he formed with Mark King and the brothers Phil and Boone Gould in the early 1980s. Their highest charting single in the UK was Lessons in Love, which reached number three in the UK singles charts and number 12 uh, on the US Billboard Hot 100 chart upon its release in 1986. Fast forward to 2021 and thanks to Covid uh, they are now embarking on a massive European tour celebrating 40 years in the music industry and Mike is about to release his latest solo album entitled Changes 2. I caught a word with Mike midweek while they were stopping off in Oslo on their latest leg of their European tour and I started by asking him quite literally about the last 18 months and how it's affected the whole industry and of course Level 42. It's been a bit of a nightmare for everybody, how's it um, How's it been for you? Well yeah, uh, the same you know, and uh, until this tour started basically. Um, at the beginning of October so I mean this was supposed to have happened a year ago in 2020 and it was supposed to be all part of our 40th anniversary uh -huh. celebrations and we were, had other tours booked and of course everything like everyone else all went out the window uh, with the hope that it would come back at some point so uh, you know we've all been you know uh, well we've been on the road for nearly seven weeks now uh, but we've all been very grateful to the fact that we can be here and do this and uh, yeah. you know we just dodged the bullet because we just came from doing nine shows in Holland and literally two days before they announced the you know their lockdown and our yeah. last couple of gigs were in jeopardy but we managed to get them get them done because quick you know venue changed from a standing to seated so then it was allowed and all of this sort of thing yeah been a few days late the whole thing would have been off so uh you know our, our timing <laughs> seems to be really good yeah. the audiences have been amazing everywhere in the uk in holland and you now we got four shows here in scandinavia so i'm really looking forward to that right i mean is, is life on the road is it a lot different than it than it was before or is it pretty much much of a muchness well no i mean i mean the, the thing is when you've got something that you do all the time taken away from you, you start to kind of have a new appreciation when you go back to what was normal and yeah. hasn't been. So I think there's an element of that. Also because of COVID, we've had to be in a bubble for the whole of the tour, which means we can't interact with any fans, you know, no guests backstage, not even friends or family. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been very different. Um, you know, seeing anyone, no meets or greets. Um, so we just basically interact with uh, the audience when we're on the stage during the show. Right. Um, so I think that's probably heightened that kind of experience. Uh, and it's been really good. So we've really enjoyed that. And, um, you know, I'm kind of looking forward to going home, but I'm kind of, you know, wanting to wring the last piece of goodness out of this because you know, <laughs> yeah. who knows when it will happen next. No, you're absolutely right. And you said to me earlier that you've uh, you've got a little bit of a cold, and I thought this got it made me it made me chuckle a bit because you can't have a little bit of a cold anymore. You've either got COVID or you haven't. <laughs> it's, it's funny, <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you know we've we've had a cold. Unfortunately, it's sort of going round. You know, some of the Korean bank because there's like 16 of us on a bus. Yeah. So you know, of course, if someone gets something, it's bound to, to go around. But you know, we've been testing every day. And uh, so, of course, every time anyone gets a sniffle, it's like, oh, oh, do a yeah. test. But we kind of yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> well, my you know, wife says it to me all the time. If you cough, she'll go, oh, is that a new cough? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, it's the best excuse for man flu going, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. And obviously, when I, when I speak to anybody in the music industry, I always ask them about where it all started for them. But for you, I think it was a... I mean, you were almost like a music protege, weren't you? You weren't just trying your hand at it. You were always seemingly 
going to go into the music business? Well, I mean, I don't know about Protégé, but uh, I suppose what was kind of handy was that both my parents were musicians. And so I grew up with it, you know, all around the house all the time. So it was kind of like normal to me. And, yeah. you know, my playroom was effectively the sitting room, which had piano, guitars, hand drums, yeah. and people coming around to rehearse with my mum, who was a singer, songwriter, and, um, you know, a company arriving. And, uh, you know, my dad up in his study in the early days, you know, working and then a knock on the door at 6 a.m. because the copyist came round to collect his score to copy it out for a second that day. I mean, yeah. this is way before the days, of course, of computers and yeah. soft, you know, notation software. This is all hand done. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it just seemed, uh, and I took private lessons whilst going to sort of state schools until I got to 14 and then I went up to Cheatham School of Music. Yeah. And uh, then music became much more of a kind of a full-time thing and then to music college and that's where I met um, you know Phil in initially and then he introduced yeah. me to Mark and the whole thing got going from there. Well weirdly that's where we've got something in common because I studied at the Guildhall as well. Oh um, right. Not, not as a musician but as a in the drama department. I was, okay. uh, that was my thing uh, but um, when were you there? Uh, 89 I went uh, but I studied. I was there for about four years because I I injured my back, so I had to restart my course. But um, right. but I absolutely loved it, and it was it was more it, when when I think back the memories of it, the the the, the music yeah. department always had something going on in uh, lunchtime concerts and all. You know, it was just a fantastic. But you you studied there as a as a drummer, right? Yeah, I went there as a, a, a percussionist. That was my first study. By that time, I started on piano, but. When I was at Cheatham, so the music director suggested I take up percussion, and uh, it was a really good suggestion because it meant that um, I got to bang and hit all of these things, obviously. But it meant I was in the band; I got to play in the orchestra because right. you know there wasn't really room for a pianist in the orchestra unless you're the soloist, and I wasn't never I was never going to be a concert pianist. That wasn't my thing. So it was great, and by the time I came to auditioning for the colleges, um, I realised, you know, I calculated a sort of much better chance. Uh, as a percussionist in those days, uh -huh. uh, because it was quite a sort of niche, you know, um, area. So it was great. And being at the Guildhall was fantastic too, because in those days, when I started there in 77, uh, some of my friends went to the Royal College and Royal Academy. They were really, really anti anything that was non-classical. Mm -hmm. Whereas Guildhall, because it had a drama department, you know, there were always the collaborations going on. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of the drama students wanted to sing songs and so we had various workshops where they could sort of drop in and do open mic stuff. We did theatrical productions which involved music and drama yeah. and it had a much more open-minded attitude so it was it was really good to be there at that time. Mm. I remember going to Paris and did um, a workshop with uh, Yehudi Menuhin and it was I think it was four <laughs> violin players from the, the music department and um, and me and another girl from uh, from the from the drama department, and it was fantastic. We were in Paris for a week at the Conservatoire, and we just had a blast. It was incredible. Yeah, but um, yeah, you're absolutely right though about the Guildhall. It was very much, uh, although so, uh, often classical based, it wasn't predominantly that, was it? They 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 almost did, they almost pushed you to be different in that respect. Yeah, and I mean, the year after I left, I think, uh, well, I left in 1980 um, because we just made our first couple of singles. Um, 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 but uh, the jazz course started in that next academic year, and that became quite a big thing. I've met musicians since who went to Guildhall to study jazz. So it was, yeah, I think it was just a recognition that, um, you know, the creative field was, was not limited and you know, why not embrace you know, where people are going to end up going because yeah. not everyone's going to end up in an orchestra. No, absolutely. And did you say that, that all you met the other guys from Level 42 there or were they just at that time? I met, I met Phil Gould, first of all. He was having part-time lessons with my percussion teacher. Right. He was still living on the Isle of Wight, coming up every two weeks for a lesson. And I just bumped into him one day, playing the drums like like no one I'd heard in the yeah. studio. So we sort of got chatting and we had a jam. And then he told me his brother was in America with this guy called Mark King, who was another amazing drummer from the Isle of Wight, and that we should meet up when they get back, which we did. And, you know, we sort of hang out and listen to records and talk about who the best drummer is. And eventually, you know, uh, kind of let's, let's try and get a band together. So I booked the percussion room 
and uh, in fact, I booked our first gig at the Student Union Bar in the Gilby, All right. Uh, which uh, should have been amazing, but got stopped after three numbers by the police because the neighbours in the Barbican Flats had complained about the noise. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not very open to that kind of thing, I seem to remember. But uh, even if you were talking too loud, walking through the Barbican was, uh, yeah. So when you when you formed the band, were you, was, you, was it a natural, did you go for that genre straight away or...? Did you sort of like have a jam and see how you got on? How did it work? Well, I mean, the thing was that we, our, our idols and our influences were uh, musicians who played in kind of jazz, rock, jazz fusion bands at the time. And uh -huh. that's what we were trying to emulate. You know, we started out trying to be just a kind of instrumental group and just making up riffs and trying to be John McLaughlin and Chick Career and Herbie Hancock. And, mm -hmm. and it was... Uh, uh, Phil and Boone, who was the drummer and guitarist in the original lineup, their older brother John was working at MCA Records in promotions. And he had connections and he knew someone with a small label that was looking to sign a band. And so this guy came along and heard us. And uh, he was the guy, Andy Soika, he knew that there was a market for our music if it had vocals in it, because there was this underground sort of jazz funk thing bubbling up at the end of the 70s, early 80s. Yeah. And Andy had a record shop and he could see what was going on. So uh, he basically plugged us into that audience. So uh, our first record was bought by them. Our first gigs were attended by those guys who were into that kind of music. And then we got labeled as being a British jazz funk group. And yeah. we were like, well, we don't want labels, you know, we're ourselves, we're like nobody else, of course. This yeah. is back to the early tapes now, you can hear it's jazz funk all over the place. But uh -huh. that was kind of where we were coming from. So uh, 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 we were all really amazed that people bought the record in the first place and um, because we had to make our first tunes into songs that started us on the road of songwriting and because we had what was a standard record company deal with Polydor five albums in five years that was effectively an apprenticeship which I don't think exists now so we had five albums to sort of get ourselves sorted out get our songwriting going work with producers learn our craft how to make an album then how to translate onto the stage did loads and loads of gigs and so that kind of got our stage craft up and uh, and so it went from there so on the face of it a five album deal sounds set uh, like most bands would never get that nowadays it's uh it we'll give you we'll, we'll try you out for a few months to see how we get on so i mean when you were signed up um was there a kind of uh by this time next year rodney we're going to be millionaires or did you think oh the hard work starts <laughs> no uh, I I mean, it, it, it actually took us, it took until our fifth album before things really started to sort of build up. So, right. I mean, that was very good in a sense because, you know, we were always about the music. That was the reason we got together. We just wanted to make the best album we could. You know, we wanted to, you know, beat everyone's pants off on stage, you know. And, you know, that, that was kind of our aim. But I don't think anyone thought that, had any idea that we'd still be in 40 years, let alone have big success because, you know, when you're 21, Five years time is just way too far in the future to even get a handle on. So Very true, it was, yeah. It was like, hey, we get some money. I can buy myself a you know a proper Moog and a proper Rhodes now. Yeah. And uh, oh, we sold enough records that they want us to do the next record. Yippee! You know, it's kind of like yeah like that. But from an from a um, from an observer's point of view, from a fan's point of view, it almost looks like you you have a whirlwind. Uh, you know shot to fame really uh because you know they, they don't think about all the stuff you were doing before we saw you on top of the pops they they sort of go oh we haven't we haven't been there that long now suddenly they're supporting queen on the magic tour which is iconic you know uh, headlining glastonbury these kind of things and you just think well obviously because they're they are who they are but they forget about all the hard work beforehand right we we um we certainly put the hours in. Like I say, we got, we were effectively given time to have an apprenticeship, which was good because I think if we'd have become overnight successes with our first album, it probably would have gone to our heads, and then you know it probably wouldn't have worked out. You know, we had to we had to kind of graft and, and slog. So by the time we did get to the heights, we kind of said, okay, this is great. We know what to do. We're in a situation where we got a lot of people in the audience suddenly, and. Um, We've learned how to sort of play to an audience of 50,000 people at Glastonbury, um, yeah. you know, which we wouldn't have been able to do if it had it happened like right from the get go. Yeah. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. 
it, 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 it always seems like that that's the be all and end all for any any artist to to play uh, especially headlining at Glastonbury I mean that'd be incredible but I mean I don't think people recognize there being a, a, an actual sort of uh, a, a way of performing to that many people it must be it must be does it, it I remember hearing somebody saying once I think it was Robbie Williams there's that many people it seems like not many is that is that fair uh I don't know if I would put it like that but uh, I think that um it's like a different it's almost like you've got to project yourself differently um mm. because you know nowadays you know we play places like, like we just have we you know, play the Albert Hall and these big concert halls you know but then we'll go to Japan and we'll play a, a jazz club or we'll go to you know America and and, pl and play much smaller venue so yeah. um you sort of ad adapt it. you know you can be playing almost the same songs on the same show but but the way that you deliver it will be different and yeah. uh, so when we do festivals and when we're playing especially when we're playing to an audience that not come to see us which we've done many times you know uh -huh. we're somewhere on the bill but we're not the headliners like we did uh, this massive festival in Quebec City in 2019 and uh can't remember who was headlining now um but but you know we had played in Canada since the 80s and we knew our job was to get out there just play the hell out of it and just get the audience a good time mm -hmm. and uh, you know basically not too many ballads in the set because that's not the way you do it you just want to go out hard hitting and up tempo yeah. but here on the tour we you know we realized that what we need to do is that we can pace ourselves and so you know you can have slow sections you can have you can be a bit more introspective because the audience who come to see you hopefully most of them know your stuff so you don't need to like make excuses for oh we're going to play a slow one now but don't worry we're going to play a quick one in a minute it's like you know, this this was this is one we really enjoy playing and hopefully some of you will too yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and I, and I need to ask you about your new album but I, I wanted to ask you about Live Aid because I, I always think well, a band of your calibre being overlooked for Live Aid that must have been a bit strange really yeah I think that's that's one that we we missed out on really I mean I think we could have been we could have been there it's just like Marlon Brando on the waterfront is it could have been a contender <laughs> yeah. I, I, I believe and this is apocryphal because I don't know it verbatim but I believe what happened is that um, some point in 1984, someone representing either Bob Geldof or Midyear probably rung up our management saying, oh, they're doing a charity record. Do you want to be a part of it? And this is way before it all happened. So, you know, yeah. with the benefit of hindsight. And I think our management probably said, oh, they're, they're busy. They've got a schedule. So mm -hmm. sorry, we can't fit it in. And so, yeah. you know, had we said yes to that opportunity, obviously, then we would have been on Band-Aid and then Live Aid would have sort of fallen suit so yeah uh but you know still live aid was was just the most fantastic thing to to just watch as a punter and uh yeah and uh, of course it was it was the making of of a load of bands uh, but you know we had our kind of moment with the prince's trust concerts in the sort of mid to late 80s uh -huh. you know i was in the super band in 87 on stage playing with george harrison and ringo Starr and eric clapton and elton john and yeah you know that that's you know, yeah. still pinch myself thinking about that incredible incredible um right so i mean we, we need to talk about your new album and we we touched on covid before is the new album sort of um a, a result of lockdown or was it going to happen anyway no i'd actually started on it in 2019 and uh i'm working with these great producers uh tony and mike uh, uh tony's got a studio in london and uh, i've worked with him before when I played with a, a Brazilian R&B group called Delata in the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s. And uh, I'd been writing some songs and uh, thinking I, I need to get and record these songs at some point. And by 2019, I'd run into these guys, thought they're just the guys for me and uh, started on it. And then COVID happened. And what happened during COVID is that, you know, I didn't sort of think I needed to rewrite the whole thing, but certainly some changes came out of that but also uh, i moved up to scotland during that during that time and so the kind of process of making the album slowed down a bit because i was like coming down from scotland once a month to work in the studio for a few days and go back up and so on but i'm really happy with the way it's turning out and it's sort of taking a bit longer than i intended but i'm happy as long as the songs that come out at the end of the day are good mm. and it doesn't matter if it takes longer 
Do you think, because um, I, I I was talking to, uh, do you know Andy Bound from Status Quo, the keyboard player? I don't uh, know him, no. Well, he, I was interviewing him last year and he's got a, a solo album out. And he, and I was thinking, it seems bizarre that you would turn your back on a band like Status Quo to do a solo album. And he said, well, it's all songs that would never have fit on a Status Quo album. So is that the same for yourself? Are they all sort of non, there's, there's, you couldn't imagine level 42 playing them or? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's difficult for me to say because I can't be objective about myself. I think from what I've, reactions I had to my kind of earlier solo albums, I think, you know, you people have said, well, they can hear where part of the sound of level 42 comes from because it's inevitably, because I'm, you know, one of the co-writers of, of, you know, something about you and hot water and the sun goes down and so on. Inevitably, it's in the DNA. So some of them will probably sound more like like that and some might sound less of that certainly i have the freedom to go into areas that i would never be able to do you know with level 42 so that makes it really interesting for me i can be more kind of personal as well in terms of the lyrics yeah yeah absolutely it's called changes too uh the first changes was out 30 years ago was yeah. that um a, an intentional sort of anniversary or it's not a swan song is it no, it, it felt like, I mean, the album is, I have to say the album's not finished yet. It's in progress. But uh, when I was putting it together and uh, as I got the ideas together and started working on it, I thought this feels like a proper body of work. You know, it's like 11 songs. It feels like a, a spiritual successor to Changes. So um, I thought, you know, why not call it Changes too? Because yeah. that's what it kind of feels like for me. I'm putting another marker in the sound. Yeah. Perfect. And it's uh, due for release early 2022. But the single, the second single off the album uh, is called You Just Can't Live As An Island. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great title. What, does it mean anything? <laughs> oh, yeah, it does. Well, I mean, on several levels, I think. But uh, the, 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 main, the main inspiration was, was when I was uh, a youngster going out to clubs, um, which I rarely did in London when I was living in London. Um, you know, I got to these amazing places like the Wag Club and, and there will be these glamorous people there and the dance floor will be full and, you know, it'd be a hard job getting in the door. You know, you had to sort of have the right credentials and all of that. Yeah. Um, but I was such a wallflower. You know, I used to stand at the wall and I was really nervous about dancing to anything except the songs that I really dug because I was kind of, I was just not extrovert about, you know, being a good dancer and... Uh, so I'd, I'd, I'd watch everyone having a good time and then they put on a, a Chaka Khan song or a Stevie song and then I'd go and shake my stuff for yep. that song and then the DJ would put something else on and then I'd go back to the wall and, you know, hoping right. dreadfully that, that, you know, that so, desperately that someone would notice me and think, oh, he's really interesting and quiet. But of course that doesn't happen, especially in a club <laughs> you can't hear yourself think. Yeah. So I'd go home, you know, thinking, hmm, nothing happened again. But So that was kind of... The, the start of the, the idea of the song, except I flipped it in the song. In the song, I'm the one on the dance floor inviting the sort of, you know, the, the sort of the, the beautiful girl that's up in the VIP sort of looking around, pretending that she's really bored, but knowing secretly that she really wants to join in. I'm trying to invite her down and join in the fun. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of one level of the song. And the other level is just, well, I mean, I've experienced myself, you know, uh, in this lockdown thing. I thought I was a loner. Um, but that's what's proved to me is I'm not anything like as much a loner as I thought I was. I mean, when if you go off on your own by choice or you want to live on your own by choice, that's fine. But when you're it's in force and you can't even visit your neighbours and they can't see you, yeah. uh, it's like, oh no, you know, I'm a human being. I need other human beings. Yeah, you know, that's why I'm so grateful being on the road with Level Forty Two again. You know, it's my mates. We're all together. I'm trying to stay up and banter a bit more, not go bed so early because yeah. we do all need each other so that's kind of you know one of the other messages in the song yeah i remember saying um sort of i, I, I quite enjoyed the first lockdown i gotta be honest and then by the second and third lockdown i was thinking i'm i'm starting to experience emotions i never i've never experienced before i wasn't i wasn't happy i wasn't sad i wasn't i wasn't depressed or anything like that it was just like a numbness that i'd never experienced in my life and i hope i'll never experience again and yeah. i was surrounded by a family you know i've got all my kids were home and and all of that so it wasn't like um i wasn't lonely 
Um, so it was just a bizarre thing. Uh, just one more thing before I let you go, Mike. Uh, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, tomorrow, and I, I like to ask this question around about this time of year, uh, we've got I'm a Celebrity kicking off. Uh, is that something you would ever Im imagine yourself doing? <laughs> never, ever, <laughs> ever. Uh, even though now it's in North Wales and it's in the castle. <laughs> I live up in Scotland. I, if I want to experience what probably goes on there, except for eating, I don't know, worms or beetles, then I can just go out my front door. No, it's no interest of me. Uh, I'll take the get me out of here bit, you know, even before yeah. the <laughs> celebrity bit starts, basically. <laughs> Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you this afternoon. Thanks ever so much for that. I really appreciate it, honestly. It's been terrific. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of your tour, and uh, we'll see you back on home soil very soon. Yes, you will. Thank you. Perfect. Cheers, Mike. Oh, you're welcome. You Just Can't Live as an Island, the second single from the brand new album from Mike Lindup called Changes 2 will be available at the beginning of 2022 and that single will be released on the 10th of December 2021 in time for Christmas. You're listening to the Stage and Screen Show with me, Andy Snowden, here on 105 Calon FM. Back in a mo. Your town, your station, your voice. Afternoons on Calon FM. Listen online at calon.com. Dot FM.